I think the most important message that I have is to remember that you, and I'm speaking to you watching this film, you make a difference. You as an individual make a difference. What you do each day actually is affecting what's going on in the world each day. So your life matters, you matter, and use your life wisely. The Western diet, unfortunately, is associated with the development of some pretty serious diseases. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. It's like a tsunami. Cardiovascular diseases are the number one cause of death. Around the globe, more than 17 million people die of a heart attack or stroke per year. The number of cancer cases is rising dramatically. One out of every four men and one out of every five women die of cancer. Diabetes has also become an epidemic, and already one out of two Europeans and Americans is overweight. The interesting thing is that all experts would agree that the cause of this tsunami uh, really is, is our lifestyle. And the fascinating thing is that the major driving force within that lifestyle, creating these illnesses, is our dependence on animal nutrition. And I think this idea needs to be conveyed to people that there is a strong association between the Western diet, high in animal foods, processed foods, protein, fat, and so forth, and diseases. People have to know that that really is true. Never before have we been so well informed about nutrition, in theory. In practice, in everyday life, we succumb to mindless cravings. We devour instant meals, gobble cafeteria fare, and stuff our faces with fast food. And practically always contained in these products, meat. Früher war Fleisch das reiche Leute essen. Und der Normalbürger hat es nicht gekriegt. Später hat es dann einmal die Woche gehabt, Sonntagsbraten. Und jetzt können wir uns das leisten, alle wie die Könige und die Fürsten zu leben. Finanziell können wir es uns leisten, gesundheitlich können wir es uns eh nicht leisten. Despite all warnings, we are eating more and more meat. There is no day without meat, no feast without meat, no break without meat. It's a normal part of our diets because it's tradition, it's cheap, and because it tastes good. My diet for 65 years was the SAD diet, the standard American diet diet. I ate meat and chicken and fish and fowl and lots of butter and anything that tasted good. In 2010, at the age of 66, Sharon Kintz started to think about her eating habits as the result of a dramatic event. At that time, I already had been diagnosed with high blood pressure, so I was aware of that. But uh, having a heart attack uh, was a complete surprise to me. Mm -hmm. 
the only symptoms that I had leading up to that was uh, heaviness in my arms, pain in my jaw, and um, I would be tired, more tired than usual. This health nightmare put Sharon Kintz in the intensive care unit. During the heart catheterization, uh, it was uh, determined that I had 100% blockage in one artery and 65% in one and 75% in the other. So there actually was uh, very little options open for me other than open heart surgery. Cadwell B. Esselstyn is an expert in the field of heart disease, a well-renowned surgeon and researcher, and one of the best doctors in the United States. Today, the 82-year-old directs the Cardiovascular Prevention and Reversal Program at the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute in Ohio. Back in the 1980s, Dr. Esselstyn had already begun questioning the methods for treating heart disease. They only combated the symptoms, but didn't get rid of the cause. Intensive research led him to the conclusion, our cardiovascular diseases are caused by our eating habits. When we look at this cause of heart disease, let's not be confused to blame it on genes or just blame it on somebody's age or blame it on the luck of the draw. Heart disease is a foodborne illness, and we now know that every time certain foods will pass your lips, you will further endanger and injure the endothelial cell capacity to make nitric oxide. Endothelial cells are crucial to our blood vessels and heart. They line our blood vessels and produce protective nitric oxide. And nitric oxide has these marvelous functions of keeping your blood flowing smoothly. It's the strongest vasodilator in the body. It also protects you from getting hypertension because it keeps your artery wall from getting stiff, inflamed, or thickened. And most importantly, a plentiful normal amount of nitric oxide will prevent you from ever developing blockages or plaque. Scientists know that cardiovascular disease starts with progressive damage to the endothelial cells. This is precisely where our diets come in. The excessive consumption of animal-based or processed foods damages our endothelial cells. Regular consumption of these products increasingly diminishes the protective nitric oxide supply in our blood vessels. This leads to inflammation and a hardening and narrowing of the blood vessels. These can have life-threatening consequences, like heart attack or stroke, or cause arteriosclerosis. Years of research and personal experience have provided Dr. Esselstyn with conclusive evidence that a plant-based diet can not only prevent the progression of heart disease, but can also reverse its effects. Esselstyn has successfully treated hundreds of patients with this program. It consists of a low-fat, purely plant-based diet. When you're willing to take the time and have the patients understand the science behind this, and they really realize that they have caused this disease by the foods that they've eaten, they suddenly realize that you are empowering them as this locus of control to halt their disease. They don't have to depend upon a cardiologist or an operation or a, a drug that may have significant side effects. They are being empowered to do this themselves. With Dr. Esselstyn's help, Sharon Kintz too, completely restructured her diet, doing away with all animal products. She turned down the heart surgery recommended to her by her doctors. 
Sharon Coons decided to use food as medicine. I was on it for four weeks and the pain went away in my arms, the pain went away in my jaws and I had much more energy. So I took Dr. Esselstyn's program very seriously. When Sharon Kintz was first diagnosed, she could hardly walk anymore. And nearly two years after her treatment with Dr. Esselstyn, she is physically fit again. And she has fulfilled one of her dreams. In 2012, at the age of 68, she successfully took part in a half marathon for the first time in her life. I know people are cramped for time, but you're talking about your health. If you want to live a long, healthy life, and be able to contribute something, then you have to take care of your body in order to do that. You, you have to, in my opinion, eat plant-based. We also consume too much milk. And the availability of dairy products continues to grow. But do these products actually agree with us? After all, nearly 75% of the world's population and 20% of Europeans are lactose intolerant. In other words, unable to properly digest dairy products. Dairy products contain no complex carbohydrates or roughage and very few vitamins. Instead, they are full of saturated fat, cholesterol, and animal protein. When we're young and growing up, everybody wants to try to feed people dairy products and make sure you have milk every day, but the science really now is at a point where that cannot be sustained. There is ample evidence from wonderful investigators like T. Colin Campbell, who clearly showed that casein, which is the major protein in milk, is really one of the strongest promoters of cancer. T. Colin Campbell is a world-renowned nutritional scientist. In a series of experiments, he was able to prove that animal proteins, casein in particular, promote all stages of cancer growth. In experiments, rats were given carcinogenic substances. Afterwards, half were fed a 5% casein-enriched diet and the other half, 20%. 20% roughly corresponds to the amount consumed in Western diets. With a 5% casein-enriched diet, the animals did not develop cancer. With a 20% casein-enriched diet, however, cancer growth was stimulated significantly. Professor Campbell went a step further Every three weeks, he altered the rat's diet. So the next thing we did, we did some studies to start out with animals here, and then let the cancer start to grow with 20% casein, and then we switched it to 5% and it went off. We gave the 20% back again, came back again. We put it on 5%, it came off. So we could turn on and turn off cancer development just by switching the amount of casein being consumed. These findings are also supported by evidence with humans. We also know that all the saturated fat and the casein in dairy helps to accelerate and promote heart disease. And then we have this whole problem of fractures in the elderly. So here we have this problem of increasing cancer, increasing heart disease, and increasing fracture. Not a good thing. Dairy really should be, uh, should be out. Es wird sehr viel darüber diskutiert, dass wir ohne Milch nicht genügend Kalzium aufnehmen. Kalzium ist wichtig für die Knochenstabilität, soll Osteoporose vorbeugen. Aber äh, Untersuchungen von Menschen, die überhaupt keine Milch und keine Milchprodukte verzehren, zeigen, dass dort die Osteoporose-Häufigkeit sehr viel geringer ist als bei uns. 
And dairy also has, um, and there's good evidence for this, it has some uh, allergenic properties. It tends to be associated with allergies, either directly associated or enhancing the allergies coming from another source. And so we see things like, in the case of teenage boys, we get this acne, they get this acne sometimes, the skin problem. A lot of that is due to their consumption of dairy. Stop dairy, goes away. Dairy is associated with uh, migraine headaches. I know of a lot of people, you know, have these migraine headaches. It's kind of an allergy kind of thing. As is acne, it's kind of an allergy kind of thing. You stop that, it goes away. And it's very fast. And I used to say that with great reluctance because I was raised on a dairy farm. I grew up milking cows. And then when I went away to do my doctoral dissertation, I actually did my dissertation on the idea of promoting more milk consumption. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying these rather negative things about dairy for any ideological reasons or any personal reasons. I'm saying it in reference to the evidence, the data. That's what it shows. The excessive consumption of animal products, such as meat, fish, dairy products, and eggs, puts a strain on our bodies. That was also what Frankfurt-based physician Lothar Wendt found in his research. My father, Lothar Wendt, had first, 1949, das Konzept der sogenannten Eiweißspeicherkrankheiten formuliert. Das haben wir in den Jahren später weiterentwickelt und die Kernthese lautet, dass das zu viel an tierischem Eiweiß in der Ernährung krank macht. T. Colin Campbell arrived at the same conclusion. He has been at the cutting edge of nutritional research for more than 40 years, and in the 80s and 90s, he directed the China Cornell Oxford Project, better known as the China Study. This is the most comprehensive nutrition study in the history of biomedical research to date. It confirmed Campbell's theory. We tend to want to consume protein, which means we want to consume meat because that supposedly makes us strong. It makes us healthy. That's been an old story for a long time. But in reality, as we put more and more protein or meat into our diet, we see these diseases start to appear. The China study, as well as numerous other studies, demonstrate one thing above all. The higher the consumption of animal products, the greater the frequency of heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and countless other chronic diseases. Even small amounts of animal products can have a negative effect on our health. The 53-year-old electrical engineer, Arthur Soteros, also became a victim of his diet. Excessive amounts of meat, fish, and dairy products. The consequences caught up with him. My first health issues started about 20 some years ago. About 20 years ago when I was about 30, 32 years of age. I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. About 10 years later propagated into heart disease. My first uh, encounter with heart disease was at age 42. What, what I exhibited was just heartburn turned out to be a blockage. Um, I went to the emergency room and found out it was a blockage and then it required an intervention and stent. That was my first encounter. A stent is an implant designed to hold a vessel open. Arthur Soteros needed to have five such stents implanted. He repeatedly suffered from chest pain and a narrowing of his blood vessels. Finally, he needed double coronary bypass surgery. So I was sure that about after doing the bypass surgery that I would be free and clear of any heart issues for at least up to, upwards to about 10 years. That happened not to be the case with me. About a year into that, I developed an angina again, and what turned out not then to be the vein graft that they used in my bypass surgery had now blocked, which then required another stent. And then a few months later, another stent, till the frequency of those stents then became just two weeks apart. The quickly returning vessel occlusions baffled the doctors. 
Soteras left the hospital without hope. I wept and I cried like a baby because I wasn't ready to die. And I cried out to God for some options. I think God saved my life. I think it was God's mercy and grace that actually gave me options and set my, set my path straight and pointed me in the direction of plant-based. Through a member of his church community, Arthur Soteros learned about Dr. Esselstyn and his nutrition-based therapy. He consulted the doctor, and with his help, he restructured his entire diet. Within 30, about 30 to 40 days from that point, the angina that I was experiencing again, and the facial numbness that I experienced during my heart disease, it was gone. And it was then by following this diet of going plant-based, within about four to, I think it was five months from that point on, when I was doing a follow-up with my cardiologist and family physician who has been monitoring my diabetes, said that my diabetes was gone. And then I followed up at that same time in October of 2010 with my optometrist. The, um, the gla prescription glasses that I was, was wearing they looked at them and said, why was I wearing these things? That all I, all I needed was just reading glasses. So then with the reversal of my diabetes, my eyesight got better. Arthur Sotero's heart condition has disappeared. His blood test results are normal, and he's been able to markedly reduce his medication. He also lost 20 kilograms of excess body weight. I feel better now at age 53 than I did at age 30. Through the years, I've had lots of students, a lot of colleagues, plenty of money to do all kinds of research. And I found out that what I believed early was wrong. That a diet that's high in animal-based foods is a problem. A diet that is high in processed foods is a problem. Many different ways. The only solution is a whole food plant-based diet. It's that clear. And when people use that, they not only prevent future disease, they actually are able to cure existing disease in people who have a disease. Ich erhielt im Dezember 2006 die Diagnose Lungenkrebs im Endstadium. Metastasen hatten sich gebildet, die Lymphknoten waren befallen, der Tumor wurde entfernt, die Lymphknoten ebenfalls. Danach wurde mir eine Chemotherapie empfohlen, die habe ich abgelehnt. Stattdessen habe ich einen Arzt konsultiert, der die Heilung mit pflanzlichen Mitteln bevorzugt. Ich bin seinen Ratschlägen gefolgt und bin heute krebsfrei, weil ich auf den Konsum von tierischen Produkten verzichtet habe und dem Konsum von pflanzlichen Produkten den Vorzug gegeben habe, aber hier in erster Linie den Unbehandelten, den Naturbelassenen, den Pflanzen, Gemüsen, Obstsorten und anderen Lebensmitteln, welche nicht erhitzt werden und so ein Maximum an Nährstoffen an mich weitergeben konnten. Das ist der Grund meiner Meinung nach, warum ich heute frei von Krebs bin. My wife, uh, Karen, was diagnosed with a serious kind of cancer, stage three melanoma. She refused to take the chemotherapy. She refused to have the, the uh, surgery. Then she got really strict about her diet. Now it's about nine years later, no problem. Die pflanzlichen Lebensmittel sind deshalb vorteilhaft, weil sie bestimmte Substanzen enthalten, die wir in tierischen Lebensmitteln überhaupt nicht finden. Zum Beispiel Ballaststoffe oder auch sekundäre Pflanzenstoffe. Wie der Name schon sagt, werden diese Substanzen von den Pflanzen synthetisiert 
Und man weiß heute, dass gerade die sekundären Pflanzenstoffe einen erheblichen, günstigen Einfluss auf unsere Gesundheit haben. Plant-based foods give us sufficient protein and healthy fats. They are rich in complex carbohydrates and antioxidants, as well as certain vitamins, trace elements and enzymes. Plant-based foods contain what humans need for a healthy diet. Das Problem ist generell, dass eben auch mit gesundheitsschädlichen Produkten wie Fleisch, Milch und Eiern ähm, eben sehr viel Geld verdient wird. Und dass diese Firmen und Konzerne natürlich Profit erwirtschaften wollen, ist klar. Und die wollen auch so viel Produkte wie nur möglich verkaufen. Auf der anderen Seite gibt es keine Interessensgruppe, die äh, Wert darauf legt, die Leute gesund zu erhalten. Wer, wer, wer hat ein finanzielles Interesse daran, dass die Leute gesund bleiben? Keiner. Die Medizinindustrie, die verdient daran, dass sie die Leute therapieren können. Nur an kranken Leuten kann die Medizinindustrie Geld verdienen. Auch die Pharmaindustrie verdient nur an kranken Menschen. We have a big, big industry that obviously supports the livestock industry and the egg industry and the dairy industry. It's just a huge, huge industry. And Unfortunately, they have infiltrated the academic community. They've also infiltrated the government. And I know both because I, I'm in academia, that's been my entire life. I see what they do, maybe they bring some money to have some research done. Um, also in the policy area, I spent about 20 years in national policy development. You know, on, I was on export panels for the government. And so where we were, doing things and we have committees and unfortunately the industry is so powerful that they in many cases are controlling who's going to be on the committees they have too much money for the politicians das ist zwar alles legal aber fair gegenüber dem verbraucher ist es nicht actually raised eating the typical diet and when I was about 22 years old I became a vegetarian and uh, about five years later when I was 27 uh, I went to a completely plant-based diet and that's been 33 years now I'm 60 years old and it's been terrific I'm, I feel great I have a lot of energy and it's not just me people that I know who are also a uh, long time on a plant-based diet are doing great as well The seismic revolution in health is just not ever going to occur from inventing another pill or a drug. It's not going to come from inventing another procedure or an operation. But the seismic revolution in health can come about when those of us in the healing profession are able to share with the public what is the lifestyle that would protect them from these chronic common killing diseases. And the way we do that really was be at the top of the list is to show them about plant-based nutrition. Immer mehr Menschen fressen immer mehr Tiere, weil immer mehr Menschen sich Fleisch leisten können. 
Und in 20 Jahren werden wir so viele Menschen und so viele Tiere auf dem Planeten Erde sein, dass nicht mehr genug Futter da ist. Und dann fressen wir die Erde kahl. The worldwide human population will rise to 9 billion by the year 2050. The global livestock population will double to 50 billion. It's going to get crowded. Es gibt den Weltagrarbericht. Es ist alles berichtet, dass wir mit dieser heutigen Form der Landwirtschaft unsere Lebensgrundlagen zerstören, den Boden zerstören, den Planeten ausplündern. Wir essen ganz einfach zu viel Fleisch. The growing consumption of meat accelerates climate change and species extinction. It damages the soil, water and air, and it spurs global starvation. Appetizing, vacuum-packed portions of meat suggest none of this. Most of the grain that's being grown on the planet is not going for food for human beings. We're growing plenty of food to feed everyone. The problem is we're feeding most of that grain and the legumes, like soybeans, to animals while people are starving. Worldwide, 1.8 billion people are starving. Every six seconds, a child dies of malnutrition. That's nearly 15,000 children a day. A sign of poverty, not for the poor, but for the rich. Only 2% of the soya in the United States is being eaten by human beings. About 70% goes for animal feed. About 28% is going for biofuel, diesel made from soya bean. So it's meeting the hunger of profits, not the hunger of people. Corn, about 10% of the corn in the world is being eaten by humans. Most of it is going to torture animals. I don't say feed animals because animals did not want to be fed with grain. It doesn't suit their digestive system. So we're talking about a system that is creating hunger on the planet in the name of feeding people. Currently, one out of every three seeds of grain harvested in the world is used as animal feed. However, industrial nations can no longer produce these huge amounts of fodder themselves. Thus, Europe already imports three quarters of its animal feed, including 35 million tons of soybeans alone, mainly from South America. The land used for growing this feed does not consist of empty fields, but valuable rainforests forced to yield to the monocultures of the agricultural corporations. One of the really uh, shocking things about this desire of more and more people to eat more and more meat and to eat it more and more cheaply is the awful effect that it's having on the environment. So whole forests cleared to graze livestock or to grow grain to feed livestock and it's having a shocking effect on the environment. Because of this practice, over the past two decades, roughly 20% of the worldwide largest rainforests in the Amazon basin have been destroyed forever. Globally, deforestation irreversibly destroys an area the size of a soccer field every two seconds.
And this, although tropical rainforests are among the Earth's most valuable treasures, nowhere else is there such a rich diversity of species. Moreover, these forests stabilize the world's climate as enormous reservoirs of carbon dioxide. That makes them more valuable than meat. Es gibt ja Berechnungen, wie klimaschädlich ein Kilogramm Fleisch ist. Nehmen wir mal ein Kilogramm Rindfleisch, dann sind das in etwa 12, 13 Kilogramm CO2. Wenn man das mal umrechnet in Autokilometer, wenn ich einen kleinen Pkw nehme, dann kann ich etwa 100 Kilometer fahren. Das entspricht dem Kilogramm Rindfleisch. Bei Geflügel und Schweinen ist es ähnlich. Dort sind es dann 50 Kilometer, die einem Kilogramm Schweinefleisch oder Geflügelfleisch entsprechen. Nimmt man da Gemüse, da landet man bei 600 Gramm. Das sind also dann ein paar Kilometer nur. Da sieht man schon, wie klimaschädlich letztendlich die Tierhaltung ist oder wie auch wie klimaschädlich mein Fleischverzehr ist. Also wenn ich was fürs Klima tun will, sollte ich natürlich weniger Auto fahren, aber ich sollte genauso auch weniger Fleisch essen. Among the side effects of the meat and dairy industry is the production of methane gas. It is primarily generated in the stomachs of ruminants like cattle. Experts estimate that methane is 25 times more detrimental to the climate than CO2. An even greater concern than methane is nitrous oxide, which is nearly 300 times more harmful to the climate than CO2. It is released through the use of synthetic fertilizers. These and many other factors make animal agriculture a catalyst for climate change. There are increased reports of a new drought of the century or a new flood of the century, a new storm of the century, or the progressive melting of the glaciers and the poles. Intensive animal farming doesn't just stink to high heaven. The excrement produced is also polluting our soil. For each kilogram of meat produced, roughly six kilograms of slurry are generated. Among other things, slurry releases ammonia, which poisons the surrounding air and causes long-term damage to the soil. Not only that, slurry and its nitrates also threaten our drinking water, of which we need inordinate amounts to make animal products. For one kilogram of eggs, 3,300 liters are needed. For one kilogram of chicken meat, 3,900 liters. For one kilogram of pork, 4,800 liters. For one kilogram of cheese, a whopping 5,000 liters. And an all-time high of 15,500 liters are needed to produce one kilogram of beef. Plant production has a much better track record. Cultivating one kilogram of grain requires 1,300 liters of water. A farmer needs just 900 liters for a kilogram of potatoes. And a kilogram of apples barely requires 700 liters of precious water. This entire meat industry has today become a scandal on the planet. It should not exist in the form in which it exists to force everyone into destroying the Earth's resources is a crime against the Earth. And it's a crime against our bodies because our, our bodies weren't designed for this kind of diet. Altogether, this is a recipe for biological disaster, biodiversity disaster, water disaster, 
climate disaster, health disaster. Diese Form der Landwirtschaft, wie wir sie heute uns eingerichtet haben, eigentlich erst in den letzten 50 Jahren, die ist in dieser Form nicht haltbar. Das kann nicht gut gehen. Jeder, der den Kopf hat zum Nachdenken und der Augen hat zu lesen und Ohren hat zu hören, der weiß das. Und da muss man sich wundern, warum ändert sich nichts? We were made to believe that meat-based diets are superior to plant-based diets, a lie that has been exposed by medical experts again and again and again. So what do we need to do? We need to bring diversity back into our farms. We need to bring harmony back into our farms. We have to celebrate diversity. We have to work with farmers, we have to know our farmers. to start realizing food is what keeps the world going. Food is the energy of the world. And we have to know exactly where in that chain we entered so that we don't do more harm. We reduce the harm. And in the process we celebrate. Food is life and life is food. Through its way of life, the Langerhorst family in Upper Austria exemplifies the practice of farming without monocultures and intensive animal husbandry. It's been running a vegan organic farm with mixed cultivation and permaculture for more than 40 years. The family grows vegetables, fruit, berries, and nuts and avoids animal-based and chemical fertilizers using green manure, plant-based compost, rock flour, mulch, and wood ash. Die pflanzliche Landwirtschaft hat uns gezeigt, dass wir auch von einem kleinen Hof anstatt von einem großen Hof leben können. Wir bewirtschaften nur dreieinhalb Hektar und davon leben wir im Vollerwerb und sind wirklich sehr dankbar, dass dies möglich und auch praktikabel ist. Wenn man sich möglichst umweltbewusst ernähren will, dann sollte man natürlich möglichst viel pflanzliche Kost zu sich nehmen. Regionalität, Saisonalität und natürlich ökologische Produkte bevorzugen, dann wird eine runde Geschichte draus. Nature shows us how to solve our problems, our personal problems and the ones that involve the whole world. We just need to take action. If we look at the chances according to human possibilities, human intelligence, human longing for good, decent food, I think the chances are extremely high that we could all live on a good, healthy, organic, plant-based diet. We love the notion of romantic rural life. Happy animals in a healthy environment, well provided for by Mother Nature. It's really quite tempting to get this meat on your plate. But let's face reality. In that time, he had a few ten steak of fish, and he had thousands, or hundreds. That means, Dieser Bezug zum Tier ist nicht mehr da. Äh, es ist halt einfach nur mehr, wirklich nur mehr Ware. Meat is less expensive today than ever before. 
a cheap product. About 98% comes from factory farms, where conditions are beyond imagination. Rarely in the past has the term industry smacked of a contempt for life as it does today. In the intensive agrarian industry, werden die Tiere nicht mehr als Individuen gesehen, sondern als bloße Produktionsmittel gleichsam wie Blechdosen, Autoersatzteile oder lediglich als Gebrauchsartikel mit dem Ziel höchstmöglichen ökonomischen, sprich wirtschaftlichen Gewinns. Chickens are by nature social, curious and intelligent animals. But in the merciless factory farm, their lives are reduced to short and joyless agony. Chicks hatch not in the maternal nest, but in the incubator. As soon as they can stand, they are sorted, vaccinated, packed up, and sent to enormous feedlots. In these animal prisons, they reach slaughtering weight in record time, never seeing daylight and under extremely crowded conditions. The normal life expectancy of a chicken is 20 years. Broilers only live up to 42 days. During this brief lifespan, they must gain roughly two kilograms. No organism can withstand such brutally rapid growth. Die Tiere nehmen so schnell an Gewicht zu, dass also die Entwicklung des Skeletts gar nicht mitkommen kann und liegen dann also sowohl die Masthühner wie auch die Mastputen am Ende der Mast fast nur noch auf ihre eigene Brust, weil die Gliedmaßen das zunehmende Gewicht nicht mehr halten können. Some animals don't survive this abnormal growth. They can't drag themselves to the feed and water troughs. Others die of breeding-induced cardiovascular diseases. They succumb to stress or fall victim to cannibalism. All these are facts we are often not aware of when eating meat and which the meat lobby is glad to keep concealed. This is a mother sow. This highly intelligent and extremely sensitive animal spends most of its life in crates in cages, hardly any larger than themselves. Instead of straw, they lie on bare concrete. Sie sind bewegungsmäßig derartig eingeschränkt in sogenannten Käfigen, dass sie nur 20, 30 cm vor und äh, 30, 40 cm zurück sich bewegen können, sich zwar hinlegen können, aber ansonsten sich nicht drehen können. Ne? Die Äh, Sauen in der modernen Schweinhaltung sind die ärm ärmsten Schweine im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes. In nature, mother sows build big, soft nests for their offspring. In factory farms, however, this isn't possible. The sows farrow in gestation crates. Confined, they are neither able to protect nor care for their young. Not long after birth, the piglet's tails are docked as a precaution against cannibalism. 
In addition, male piglets are castrated by ripping out their testicles. Everything without pain relief because an object's pain doesn't matter. Many animals are born weak, handicapped, or sick. It is not economical to keep them alive. Their fate, an undignified and cold death. In the agonizing lack of space, the immobilized mother sows sometimes crush their own offspring. At the age of three weeks, the piglets are separated from their mother. What follows now? Rearing and fattening. Although pigs can live up to 25 years, they are slaughtered as children, a mere six months old. They spend their brief lives in cramped quarters. EU norms require a minimum area of just 0.75 square meters for a porker of up to 110 kilograms. As many as 10% of the animals do not survive these conditions. In spite of this, only a few people are willing to do without a pork chop or a schnitzel. And cattle fare no better. Many animals spend their lives in narrow stalls, the lucky ones in open pens. Many, however, vegetate in tether stalls. One step forward, one step backward. That is all the freedom of movement they have. A life expectancy of 30 years? That's something industrial age cattle can only dream of. Heutzutage gibt's also riesen, riesen Herden. Und die werden immer größer und da merkt kein Mensch mehr, wenn eine Kuh krank ist. Das merkt dann meistens nur noch der Milchroboter, der dann auch feststellt, dass die Milchleistung zurückgeht. Oder die andere Maschine merkt dann, dass nicht das Futter nicht aufgefressen worden ist. Und so wird überhaupt nur noch registriert, dass ein Tier oder mehrere Tiere krank sind. Infections are one of the biggest problems in factory farms. The crowded conditions promote the rapid spread of bacteria. Overbreeding, a lack of hygiene, and ignoring natural needs put a huge burden on the health of the animals. The only antidote the industrial meat producer knows is the massive administering of drugs. Up to three quarters of all antibiotics end up in factory farms. Das System der Tierhaltung ist so krank, dass es diese Antibiotika inzwischen benötigt. Würde man diese Antibiotika wegnehmen, würden die Tiere tatsächlich massenhaft krank und sterben. Das heißt, das ganze System ist in sich eigentlich völlig krank. The routine and improper use of antibiotics in factory farms presents a big health risk, not just for the animals. Because more and more bacteria strains are becoming resistant, which renders antibiotics ineffective. If these antibody-resistant bacteria infect humans, we get sick too. But often medication no longer works. 
Globally, more than 700,000 people die from infections because the bacteria they have consumed has become resistant to antibiotics. But the animals are not only affected physically, industrial farming harms them on all levels. Seit Bestehen der Menschheit hat es kein derartiges Maß an Tierquälerei gegeben wie in unserer Zeit. Das gilt sowohl für die Quantität wie auch für die Intensität. Having once seen um, pigs in one of these intensive farms, I was so shocked. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable to me that people could treat animals as though they're just things without feelings. And so many people say to me, oh, but they're, they're being bred to eat, so it's okay, but it's, it's not okay. There's a lot of animal abuse in research, in education, in circuses, in rodeos, and zoos, but factory farming is the worst. If you summed up all the pain that we cause animals, the pain and suffering from industrial food preparation is far greater than all of the pain in any other venue combined. So it's really the worst. It's, it brings out the worst in human beings and it makes animals suffer greatly. They, they not only suffer their own pain, but they also feel the pain of other animals at these horrible factory farms. Not only our meat consumption promotes the suffering of animals, but also our growing demand for milk Cows are forced to achieve higher and higher outputs. In the 60s, a cow produced an annual average of 1,500 liters of milk. Today, that amount has risen to 10,000 and more. I have quite a few vegetarian friends who consume dairy products. And they believe this false idea that there that dairy products are a benign animal product that there's no harm connected to milk because they figure well once a cow starts giving milk she just gives milk and they don't realize that cows can't give adequate amount of milk for production unless they're pregnant and cows have the same gestation period as humans, nine months. They're pregnant, nine months give birth. Within 24 hours, maximum 72 hours, you take the calf away from the cow because you need the milk for production. It's a terrible business. I mean, there's more suffering in a glass of milk than you can find just about anything. The calves will, you know, ball and ball and ball. The the cows will just they'll look for them. Cows will often mourn their children for days or weeks.
they do miss their uh, their calves. The calves miss their mothers. <laughs> It's really, it's a heartbreaking thing to watch. In factory farms, calves are being born constantly, but they serve no useful purpose and are soon put to different use. Let's say a cow is alive for four years. She'll have four calves. Just genetic roulette. Two are going to be male, two are going to be female. The two males have no use to the dairy industry. They're going to go to auction within a day to two or three days after birth. You only need one female to replace the mom. So three out of four calves go to slaughter right after the moment. We know in our bones that harming mothers who are just giving birth to babies and nursing those babies and nurturing those babies is something that is against our own compassion and kindness. And so when we're eating animal foods, eating dairy products, that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're paying people to impregnate animals, steal their babies, steal their milk, and then kill them. I always say to people, especially women, imagine that. Imagine that you was pregnant. You got your breast ready to give milk and somebody took your baby away. And then, you know, another animal came and took your milk. It's almost, for human beings, it's almost impossible to imagine. But that's what many animals go through. And some people think, oh, goat's milk is better than cow's milk. Well, the goat is also a living thing. The goat also produced milk, not for human consumption, but for the consumption of a little baby goat. And that's who the milk should go to. People wonder whether animals, including farm animals, have emotional lives, and the science tells us that they do. If people read and understand what Charles Darwin had to say about evolution, he said that the differences among species are shades of gray, not black and white. So if we have something, then they have it too, they being other animals. So the science tells us that Many animals, including farm animals, have very rich and deep emotional lives. The main thing is that, you know, these farm animals, when you know them as individuals, they're just wonderful. I mean, there's nothing like hearing the wicker of a horse when you come and he's pleased to see you and the cows chewing the cud and the, the sweet breath that they have out in the fields and pigs, well pigs are as intelligent as dogs and more intelligent than most and uh, when I was a little girl I used to want to have a little troop of pigs and train them and go to a circus, well now I know circuses are bad but when I was a little girl, you know, pigs are amazing, just incredible. Good. 
People want to think that cows are stupid, that they're dumb, that they're slow, and all they do is eat grass. No, they have community, they have social structures, they babysit for each other, they, they uh, mourn for the loss of loved ones. You know, they're, they're a community, just like any human community. Uh, they just look different, you know, that's all. It's the only difference, they just look different. We don't speak their language, it's the only difference. We know, for example, that chickens display empathy. They feel the pain of other chickens. We know that cows and pigs are very smart. They miss one another. They love to be around friends. Um, cows and pigs are extremely intelligent. They can learn very complex tasks. So I like to say that the animals who we eat are very smart and they're very emotional. It, they're not what we eat. So if there's an animal on the plate or at the end of a fork, it's who's for dinner, not what's for dinner. Because when we use the word who, we're referring to an animal who has a very strong inner life and subjective life. So for example, when pigs and cows and dogs and cats and wolves play, it's very clear that they enjoy themselves, that they're feeling happiness, they're feeling very gleeful, they're feeling a lot of pleasure. Tiere sind Mitgeschöpfe. Tiere sind Lebewesen, die Gefühle haben, die es einem zeigen können, wenn es ihnen gut geht. Ich sehe das den Tieren an und sage den Kindern, guck mal, die Tiere können lachen, wenn es ihnen gut geht. Und die Tiere können ihren Kummer zeigen, wenn wir schlecht mit ihnen umgehen.
kein Tier geht freiwillig auf dem LKW. Ist in meiner ganzen Zeit, wo ich freischauer war, nicht einmal passiert. Das heißt, wir haben das Viech immer mit Gewalt aus dem Stall, mit Gewalt auf dem LKW. Dann hat man das zum Schlechter geführt oder in die Metzgerei. Und wir müssen einer frischen, das ist ein LKW, da sind heute sind bis 100 Stück rum, auf absolut engsten Raum. Eine Stresssituation, Angstsituation, das erkennt man entweder, dass die Tiere fangen zum Zittern an oder die Augen, die sind so ja, verängstigt einfach. Viehtreiber, Elektroschockgeräte, Knüppel, Schweine werden an den Ohren weggezogen, ähm, Bullen werden vor die Hoden getreten, damit sie laufen, Kühe vor den Euter getreten, der Nasenring beim Bullen, falls er einen hat, wenn es schwere Bullen sind, die werden so umgedreht, dass die Nase fast um 180 Grad verdreht ist, damit die Tiere gehen. Und das ist alles mit Schmerz, das ist nicht ohne Schmerz. Mit starken Schmerzen, sage ich mal. Oder das kann man nicht anders machen, es geht nicht. Es geht definitiv nicht. Man kann nicht äh, glauben, ich habe halt, äh, Massen von Tieren und die bringe jetzt mit irgendwelchen guten Zuhörern auf dem LKW auf oder vom Steuer aus oder gar in die Schlachtbank. Das funktioniert nicht. Es ist immer brutal. Es ist immer brutal. Everyone is aware that animals have to die if we want to eat meat. But very few want to know what actually takes place in a slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouses have their reasons for not welcoming visitors. In large industrial slaughterhouses, pigs are often stunned by machine. An electric shock triggers a kind of epileptic attack. This leads to unconsciousness. In smaller operations, stunning by electric current is generally done by hand before the animals are suspended from a conveyor and their throats slashed. Und Schweineschlachten an sich ist halt so schwierig, auch für die Menschen, weil die Tiere schreien. Ohne Ende. Sie schreien ohne Ende. Das hört sich an, ich habe früher immer gesagt, als wenn kleine Kinder schreien. Warum schreien kleine Kinder? Weil sie Angst haben. Bei den Tieren ist das nicht anders. large meat factories, gas chambers are standard practice. The pigs are herded into a gondola and lowered into a chamber where they are gassed with a mixture of carbon dioxide and air, leaving them unconscious. The co 2 betäubung is a relatively billiges Verfahren. It has the advantage, wie andere Gasbetäubungsverfahren auch, dass mehrere Tiere gleichzeitig betäubt werden können. Man muss also die Gruppe nicht auseinanderreißen. Der deutliche Nachteil des CO2 ist es allerdings, dass die Tiere doch ein Erstickungsgefühl über doch einen ganz erheblichen Zeitraum haben von 15 bis 20 Sekunden. Also ein Gefühl der deutlichen Atemnot. Die Tiere streben oft nach oben, man hört äh, Lautäußerungen, sie schreien. Once they have been stunned, the pigs' throats must be quickly and properly slashed. Otherwise, the animals wake up and land in the cauldron of boiling water, fully conscious. This is no uncommon occurrence, since the whole process takes place so quickly. Zur Problematik der Schlachtgeschwindigkeit äh, muss man sicher noch anmerken, äh, dass bei einem Tempo von beispielsweise 750 Schweinen in der Stunde äh, der Mensch, der die Schweine absticht, also der sogenannte Stecher, äh, ziemlich genau fünf Sekunden Zeit hat, dieses Messer in den Hals der Tiere einzustechen. Dazu muss er das Schwein aber erst auch noch greifen, äh, an einem Vorderbein sozusagen in Position ziehen. Er muss das Messer aus der Alterung entnehmen und äh, dann sind diese fünf Sekunden auch schon gleich vorbei. Das heißt, er hat gar keine Möglichkeit, 
äh, einen Stich in irgendeiner Weise zu korrigieren, wenn er der Meinung ist, er hat keine großen Gefäße erwischt oder er hat große Gefäße äh, verfehlt. Das heißt, ähm, das ist äh, sicher ein Problem für die Effektivität der Entblutung. Ich habe sehr oft gesehen, äh, wie Tiere nicht richtig betäubt waren. Schweine, die aus dem Brühkessel geflohen sind oder gesprungen sind, versucht haben rauszukommen, wo äh, ein Kopf schlechter hingegangen ist und hat äh, mit einer Eisenstange äh, nochmal draufgehauen. Äh, das ist eigentlich Standard, das ist, das ist, das ist völlig normal. All pigs can meet this fate. Animals from organic farms are no exception. Once it is cut into pieces, the animal has finally endured all the agony the industry has to offer. Chickens are processed fully automatically and at a high speed. On average, 10,000 animals per hour can be stunned, killed, cleaned, and cut into parts in a modern slaughterhouse. Europe's largest poultry slaughterhouse is in Germany. It can handle up to 27,000 animals an hour. That's 432,000 chickens a day. The slaughter of cattle starts with a captive bolt stunner, which has been standard procedure for decades. The animals are driven along a chute into a narrow box. Not every animal goes to its death willingly. In this betäubungsfall, werden die Tiere mit einem sogenannten Bolzenschussgerät geschossen. Das heißt, das äh, ist ein äh, Bolzen, der die Schädeldecke durchdringt und äh, das Hirn partiell zerstört. Und äh, die Tiere brechen dann in der Regel äh, sofort zusammen und äh, sind also in Sekundenbruchteilen bewusstlos. Problematisch ist es, äh, wenn der Schuss eben nicht richtig sitzt, wenn die, die Bolzenschussgeräte nicht richtig angesetzt werden können oder das Tier im letzten Moment den Kopf bewegt. Dann haben wir sogenannte Fehlschüsse. Die Tiere sind entweder nur leicht oder gar nicht betäubt. Und das ist vom Tierschutz her natürlich kritisch, weil dann der zweite Schuss, der dann erfolgen muss, meistens auch nicht mehr richtig wirkt, weil die Schädelkapsel schon eröffnet ist. Und diese Druckwirkung, die beim ersten Schuss da ist, beim zweiten Schuss eben nicht mehr da ist, sodass ich dann tatsächlich Probleme kriegen kann, das Tier effektiv zu betäuben. Warum muss man denn die Menschheit, den Konsumenten vom Schlachten äh, wegsperren, wenn das so richtig wäre? Warum denn? Bei keiner Prägelistproduktion muss er wegschauen. Bei jedem Bäcker gibt es halt Schaubäckereien. Aber eine Schauschlechterei gibt es im ganzen Land nicht. Ja, da dürfen wahrscheinlich alle Zuschauer rein, weil es umfallen. Weil es so brutal ist. Weil es einfach gewollt ist. Irgendwo kommt man dann an die Grenze, wo man dann sagt, man macht weiter oder man macht nicht weiter. Bei mir war die Grenze halt wirklich, wir mussten Kälber schlachten und dann hat sich schon gesträubt beim Reinkommen. Und äh, ja, da sollte ich das halt schießen, als es drin war. Und dann rollte dem eine Träne aus dem Auge und dann habe ich das den Schussapparat in der Luft abgeschossen. Und habe gesagt, das war's. Ich bin an meinem Chef vorbei, Ölschirf, der Schussapparat in die Hand gebrückt und habe gesagt, das war's jetzt. Ich war nichts anderes als der Auftrag, das Killer, Auftrag oder der Söldner für, für alle die, die Fleisch essen wollen, der Söldner. Das heißt, ich habe Geld kassiert, für das bringe ich die um, bringe ich Viech um.
Und wie mir das bewusst worden ist, habe ich aufgehört. Humans are creatures with many contradictions. What is especially paradoxical is our relationship to animals. We can adore a pet, and at the same time, we let other animals be killed without the slightest compassion. Dr. Melanie Joy calls this phenomena carnism. Carnism teaches us to place animals in categories in our minds. Some animals we love, Dogs and cats are our companions, our family members, our friends, for instance. Other animals, we eat. Carnism teaches us to see animals as objects. So we learn to refer to um, the turkey on our plate as something rather than someone. And carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality or personality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a group about which we've made generalized assumptions. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. Carnism, says Dr. Joy, is a belief system intended to prevent us from recognizing the violence and cruelty of the system behind eating animals. We suppress and deny. We ignore our head and our heart when it comes to animals that we classify as edible. Choosing one animal to eat and one animal to be a pet is just some people call it speciesism. It's just a, it's a kind of racism. It's a kind of favoritism. And it's a kind of just following a particular culture. Now, what we have to do is we have to build a culture and traditions based upon compassion. highest form of living, the highest value, is compassion. And when there is compassion, we ma maximize well-being. After all, what the word wealth comes from well-being. It did not mean money in the hands of a few. It meant well-being shared across life spectrum. I think once we admit that we humans are not the only beings with personalities, minds and feelings, once we realize that we are part of the animal kingdom, then it becomes quite as important how we treat animals, all animals, as how we treat each other. And so only when we show respect and consideration and concern for other living beings can we imagine a world that's more peaceful than the one today? We are at a threshold where across the world people are seeking the liberation of life from this stranglehold of objectification, the view that the earth is dead matter and our beings are just objects. We have to rise in subjecthood of an interconnected subjecthood where no life is less important than any other life 
and human beings are definitely not the emperors over the rest of life, are just one strand in that web of life. I think the reason that so many people don't change their behavior is because they feel, what's the use? I'm just one person, so what I do actually can't make any difference. And nor would it make any difference if it was just one. But more and more and more people are coming to understand what the problems are and what they ought to be doing. Never ever think that one person can make a difference. We tend to focus our energies on looking for leaders, say like Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi. But they were just one person. They didn't set out in life to be a leader. And they were very humble people. Um, it's just that circumstances in history drew them to the front. But if we're looking for leaders, all we have to do is go home and look in the mirror because each one of us can make a difference. And we do. It's just making a conscious decision that we are going to make a difference in our lives. We're not on this planet for a long time. So we need to do what we can in the time we've got to make a difference. Für mich war es immer wichtig zu betonen, dass wir äh, als Erwachsene alle Vorbilder sind. Diese Vorbildfunktion können wir uns nicht aussuchen. Wir können nicht sagen, ich will gar kein Vorbild sein, sondern wir werden als Vorbild genommen, sei es von Kindern, sei es von Verwandten, von Kollegen oder von Sportsfreunden. Und ich glaube, diese Tatsache, dass wir als Vorbild genommen werden, sollte uns dazu motivieren, dass wir uns auch vorbildlich verhalten. Every one of us can make a difference. Every one of us eats at least two to three times a day. And every act of conscious eating of knowing what the consequences of your eating are. Knowing what you're eating is an act of changing the world. I think the most important message that I have is to remember that you, and I'm speaking to you watching this film, you make a difference. You as an individual make a difference. What you do each day actually is affecting what's going on in the world each day. So your life matters, you matter, and use your life wi wisely. <laughs>